welcome back welcome back everyone to um zoom and so sorry for the the technical difficulties uh we have tried the platform many many times and tested it and we found this particular day to fail on us um however we are so fortunate to have dr tom and sal here and i'm not going to go into detail i've shared his introduction uh, with you earlier we are recording this session so if you have had an issue um, in the past with the, the hoping system and did not hear part of it, we will start this webinar and Dr. Insel's keynote from beginning and record it and post on our website, on our conference website, so you can watch it. Dr. Insel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, thanks very much, Pinar. I guess, uh, if nothing else, this experience is, uh, makes a critically important point, which is that technology sometimes is a solution, sometimes it's a problem. And in a conference about technology and mental health, maybe the most important lesson from all of this is to remember that it's just a tool. And sometimes it does help. Uh, occasionally it creates its own set of problems, but it's not by itself uh, the full solution that we need to deal with the problems of equity that um, Pinar, you mentioned already in, in your remarks. So I'm gonna share my screen, I'll jump back into this. We'll go a little more, uh, it says here that host disabled participant screen sharing. So I'm gonna to have to ask uh, for someone to give me the ability to share my screen. You should be good to go, Tom. Okay, thank you. And we are good to go. All right, so you should be able to see the slides now. I'll bring them up in a way that makes it easier. And we're gonna go through these three points on the problem, solutions, and equity rather more quickly than I expected. But in fact, I think you can get the main thrust of what I want you to hear about. First of all, is, is the point that we do have a serious crisis in behavioral health. That was true before the pandemic. And it, you see that in terms of the lack of uh, improvement in either measures of morbidity, which is here looking at the years lost to disability. Uh, neuropsychiatric disorders are at the top because they are the illnesses of young people. They start before age 24, 75% of the time, very different from cardiovascular disease or cancer. And of course, we have suicide. Now, the key here is not only that we haven't made progress, but that in the United States, almost uniquely, we have really slipped uh, in terms of progress. We've had a 33% increase in suicide at a time when the rest of the world is actually doing quite a bit better and we're doing so much better in other areas of medicine. Uh, you of course know about the opiate epidemic, the uh, magnitude of this is just stunning, but the new data out on Friday show that the pandemic has pushed this even beyond anything that we've known before, 87,000 deaths, uh, in uh, 2020, uh, not even counting the last three months of the year, that's uh, almost, uh, well, nearly a 30% increase over the previous year, uh, which was, as you can see from this graph, already setting a record. Putting all this together, you've got these deaths of despair, which had already in 2018 doubled uh, from where we were in the 90s. And for the first time really in a century begun to reduce lifespan in America. And all of these suicide, drug overdoses, alcohol related deaths are ultimately behavioral health problems. You throw on top of that the pandemic with COVID-19 and you have what the United Nations has described as really the beginning of a second pandemic. Now on top of what we, was, we were already seeing as a crisis, we're now seeing um, an emergence, especially for young people, for people between the ages of 18 and 24, uh, the possibility of uh, significant rises in both morbidity and mortality to an extent that we haven't seen before. Now, it's um, important to talk about why that's happening and why we have this crisis in care even prior to the pandemic. The most common explanations I hear are things like this. We don't know enough. We don't have enough therapists. We don't have effective treatments. Uh, we don't spend enough. I wanna convince you that virtually all of those are just absolutely wrong. We know enormous amount. Uh, we have 600,000 therapists, which is just by 
in context. And that's about three times the number of primary care doctors in the United States. We have highly effective treatments. Some are medications, some are psychotherapies. We now have uh, devices for neuromodulation that are showing themselves to be increasingly effective. We have a huge amount to offer and we spend over $200 billion a year in this country on behavioral health. So these aren't, these aren't the explanation. The explanation is actually that what we have is a care crisis. These aren't, this isn't a typical public health crisis like COVID where you have an emerging infectious disease. These are diseases that have been with us a long time. The truth is we used to do much better. And what we've had now is a failure of care. I want to um, lay out three areas where that seems to really matter. One is that most people who could and should be in care are not uh, over half. Uh, those who do get into care find a fragmented, episodic, reactive care system, often with people who are not trained to do the things that actually work. Again, uh, that's an exceptional aspect of mental health. You do not see that to the same extent in other areas of medicine. And finally, there's a, a, a lack of accountability. We just don't measure in this field in the way we do in the rest of medicine. So those three things together, I think, are really powerful reasons why the system is broken down. And we're seeing this failure to bend the curve for morbidity and mortality. The good news is there are a range of solutions. And in spite of my um, funky remarks about technology and experience we've had this morning, there's actually a lot we can do with data, with analytics and technology. And you're going to hear a lot about this in the panel to follow and in the next couple of days. Uh, just maybe to frame it up, if you just think about how we all get goods and services today, Amazon, Google search, whatever it is, they're entirely consumer focused and on demand and easy, full of information. You can have some sort of agency and proactive experience here. That's just not the way healthcare looks. It's built for providers and payers, not for patients. Uh, up until this past year, it was almost entirely brick and mortar based. Um, the experience is not on demand, it's delayed. It's very difficult to know what the costs are or how to comparison shop. And it's entirely, a, it's not really a healthcare system, it's a sick care system. It's built around being reactive for when system, when people uh, are in crisis or when they're least able to do what they need to do to get well. This is the good news is if you take those three problems, the lack of engagement, the lack of quality, the lack of accountability, there are in fact solutions for each one. And we're gonna go through these very quickly, but for we have uh, ways of developing person-centered care. We can train online and get better coordinated care and we can measure and get value-based uh, kinds of care, all with the help of uh, data science, better data and technology. Just three very quick examples. On the engagement front, a company that I co-founded that Pinar mentioned, the idea of creating mental health that uh, services that look more like minute clinics so that they're available on demand through, uh, through online access. And they create a kind of experience that people really like, a little bit like Peloton, where you um, are part of a community, you have a membership, you um, can both get help and give help, uh, and you're um, able to do this in a way that uh, provides a, a sense of agency uh, for uh, being able to recover. When you think about quality and the opportunity to, to train online, one of my favorite examples of this is a company that currently is based just in the UK called AISO, in which they are doing a synchronous chat for therapy and uh, have built in natural language processing. So they're looking at the language in every chat experience and giving immediate feedback to therapists about what's working and what isn't so that therapists can get better and better as they work. And as you can see from the data that they collected in over 100,000 patients at this point in the National Health Service in the UK, their recovery rates have just Im improved enormously this, these, these data are based on about 3,000 patients, but you can see that using this kind of rapid feedback and real-time instruction, they've been able to go from about 46% recovery to 
um, over 67%, which is just uh, an extraordinary rate for outpatient psychotherapy. The third one, accountability, is all about measurement. And so if IESO is giving data back about what therapists are saying, this is giving uh, data back all insights about what patients are experiencing and making sure that both patients and therapists can see this in real time. Uh, basically, as oh, I think all of you would know, we've really moved to this telehealth uh, concept in 2020 in a big way because of COVID. Um, but I'd argue that we're far from where we want to be with that. And what we really need is something like the IESO and OWL Insights approach that bring an enormous amount of data into the interaction. So that telehealth 2.0 is informed not only by what people say, but how they say it, if they're typing, how they're typing. You use the sensors from the phone to learn a lot more about when people are becoming socially isolated or when they're not sleeping or uh, when they're not leaving their homes. And you can begin to take the kinds of tools we have to read emotion and to read um, um, the sort of sentiment and coherence of speech uh, and, and be able to do that in real time to uh, support important decision making. So basically what I'm suggesting is that we need to go into a space where instead of getting just only subjective measurements of mood and cognition and behavior, we're able to do this in a way that's objective, continuous, ecological, and passive. It doesn't actually require a lot of time but you're capturing what people are thinking, feeling, and what they're doing uh, as they do it, which is something that the phone, of course, is very, very good at, either the phone or another wearable. I like to use this expression a lot that if we don't measure, our confidence grows much faster than our competence. And that is something that I think all of us in this field have got to reckon with, because if we want to bend the curve, we're going to have to do better in the way that we deliver treatment. Uh, more about that in just a moment, because I'm gonna put a footnote on that statement that I've just given you. It's also important to recognize that while we can transform care, that by itself is probably not gonna be enough. But to summarize what I wanted to tell you about this, the, the mental health care landscape, we have this ability now with technology and with the ability to collect enormous amounts of data um, to do a, a whole range of things that were not really possible a couple of decades ago. And I would argue that probably of all the areas of healthcare that will be changed by technology, this is the one that's going to, at least by, by, the, by mobile technology, by the smartphone, this is the one that will probably have the greatest impact. We have the ability to deliver almost all of the important therapeutic interventions, and for that matter, medications as well, through a mobile platform. Uh, that is obviously not true for surgery. It's not true for most of what happens in the rest of medicine. But here in a field that's all about listening for what's said, listening for what isn't said, and being able to intervene in a way that provides a set of skills and coaching and even peer support. And even for crisis, we can do that on the phone. The ability to take that data and create a far more coordinated measurement-based system uh, going to be enormously helpful giving that kind of feedback to improve confidence or incompetence not just confidence and also uh, then being able to measure in real time we sometimes call this digital phenotyping you'll hear more about this in the upcoming panel but this ability to pick up those signals and begin to use them to know what's working what isn't essentially creating this learning engine so that you learn from what you're doing and you become iteratively, iteratively better at delivering care and improving outcomes. That's really the vision. We're not there yet. But I must say, I think in all three of these segments, we're making very rapid progress. Uh, lots of, in, uh, lots of uh, investment here, uh, lots of innovation. And I'm hopeful that over the next three to five years, we'll begin to see lots of impact. Now, um, a lot of what drove this conference was uh, the issues of equity, which of course are uh, top of mind in Minnesota these days. Um, 
but they're also top of mind across the country. And there is a real relevance to what I've just been talking about in terms of um, the, the needs of people with serious mental illness in this equity framework. And this may sort of set up the discussion for the next couple of days. I, I, some of you will recognize that this map is, is the Washington DC Metro map. Uh, Michael Marmot, who's one of the real thought leaders in the world of thinking about equity in health, talks a lot about the difference between health and health care. As he likes to say, um, health care is the repair shop. It's where you go when something goes wrong. Health is what's happening on the highway. It's what's happening in the course of uh, your travels through life. Uh, if you look at this metro map, what Marmot points out is that the distance from inner city Washington to the suburbs, for instance, to Bethesda, where the NIH is located, or to Shady Grove, just bought beyond it, is, uh, is altogether about a 17-mile journey. And yet there's a 20-year difference in lifespan in that 17 miles, which is really kind of mind-boggling to realize that how long you live probably depends more on your zip code than on your DNA code. In fact, it's for those of us who are thinking mostly about healthcare as the solution to problems of health, we should probably recognize that um, even some of our most magnificent interventions don't really hold a candle to this kind of impact of place on longevity. For instance, recent meta-analysis done for statins looked at um, how, how much do statins uh, increase longevity even when taken for many, many years. And overall, we're not talking here about 20 years or 10 years or two years. It's a 12.6 day increase in longevity. That by comparison, wouldn't even get you out of Metro Center at the very beginning of this journey. So we, we need to sort of put this into context to think about if we care about health and not just health care, uh, we, we've got to get beyond just talking about what we do in the clinic or what we do in the hospital. In fact, uh, many people who've looked at this question about what determines health outcomes would say that only about 10% of our outcomes are determined by healthcare, by clinical care. That something like 70% of what we care about in terms of health and health outcomes is determined by social and economic factors or health behaviors. And then there are other factors here as well. It's important because in the United States, we're spending three and a half trillion dollars a year on, on healthcare. And yet when you think about that other 70% of the so-called social determinants, it's usually based on holding a bake sale, depending on philanthropy, getting some other sources of revenue, uh, but often very, very thin. This is really critical when we talk about uh, the needs of people with serious mental illness. And what I want to share with you, and, and maybe the most important take-home point here is that the model there is not simply healthcare in the way we've thought about it before, uh, but it's something much broader. It's, it's really forcing us to think about recovery. Um, I usually put recovery into what I fondly call the three Ps, uh, talking about people, place, and purpose. And I need to point out that, of course, COVID has um, been a problem for all three of those Ps, especially for people in underrepresented minorities in this country. But let's go quickly through this because I, I, I think it is important and I hopefully will set up what you're going to hear over the next couple of days. Um, the first P around people has been really highlighted by uh, our current and for that matter, our former uh, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy, who's back in the same job that he had during the Obama years in the interregnum during this last administration, when he had some time off, he wrote this book called Together, which I can't um, 
I can't endorse enough. It's just an extraordinarily important book for helping us to understand loneliness as a public health crisis. And of course, this is as much a problem, arguably more of a problem for people with mental illness than for anyone else. The, the needs for thinking about place really calls forth the problem of poverty in America and the importance of thinking about um, all of those issues, whether it's homelessness or lack of opportunity or food, food insecurity or a whole range of different kinds of adverse experiences, as well as racism and exclusion. Uh, I think it's really important for us to recognize that as much as mental illness itself can be seen as a social justice problem. When you, when you think about the sort of double jeopardy of people of color and people having serious mental illness, what you really see is um, that that population is almost, not entirely, but largely outside of the healthcare system. If they have serious mental illness, they're going to be incarcerated in a jail or prison, not in a health hospital or clinic. Uh, they're more likely to be homeless and they're generally just much, much less likely to be in care. Um, that is not just a health problem then, that becomes really a social justice or a civil rights problem. And finally, this whole question about purpose. Um, I often use this Nietzsche quote that he or she who has a why can live with almost any how or um, something that was said to be by one of my advisors, Marsha Linehan, that if you really want to bring down mortality, reduce suicide, you've got to have people need, who have something to live for. Uh, it's important to recognize in thinking about what we can do in the short term, that you can help people who have lived experience to be able to use that expertise to help others to pay it forward we've been able to find that the sort of whole peer movement has uh, really activated a community that previously was excluded from uh, the care team to be able to find a purpose, a mission. Uh, it's been probably as important for those they help um, to be able to give help, uh, really a critical piece. To summarize what I think about in this area is that um, I think when we talk about mental illness, we do need to use medical terms to define it. Uh, I mean, if it's not a medical problem, then we can't expect insurance, health insurance, to pay for it or healthcare to pay attention. So it is a medical problem, but it's important to recognize that the solutions are way beyond what we traditionally consider medical. They're, they're social, they're environmental, they're, they're political. I mean, this is in fact increasingly a social justice issue. Technology is really a, can be a really critical piece of this. And as I just mentioned in the previous section around solutions, it can not only connect people, but it can democratize care and it can train people with mental illness to help each other. So there's an opportunity here, particularly for this conference. I, I just can't help but say this. It's, we've had enormous investment in the last year, especially in behavioral health technology, $1.8 billion, which is actually more than the NIMH is putting into new research on the extramural side. That's coming from the VC community. Dare I say, very little of that is doing what needs to be done here to support recovery. Very little of it is going into connecting people, democratizing care and training people to help those with serious mental illness. Some of it is, but it's a tiny fraction of what we're gonna to need to actually bend the curve for mental illness. So I started and hopefully um, you saw that initial piece that was in the hop in part of this program by saying that we have these conundrums that we've had unprecedented progress in neuroscience, psychology, technology, and yet Mental health care and mental health remains largely unchanged. Uh, and, and even the bigger problem that more people are getting more treatment and yet results have never been so poor. Um, the, the point I think in explaining both of those conundrums is it's, it's not just healthcare. Uh, 
we have to think way beyond that. We have to think about people, place, and purpose. And, and, and we have to reframe this to say, okay, the problem is brain disorders. These are medical problems. But the solutions are way beyond that as well. The solutions which really fit into this recovery framework are, are social, they're environmental, and they are even at this point political. So just to summarize a very quick um, run through of uh, what I wanted you to hear before we go into the panel is that um, we are in the middle of a crisis made worse by this COVID pandemic. It's a crisis not only in mental health care, but in mental health itself. Uh, we do have solutions. Don't let any, anybody tell you that we don't have good treatments, we do. But they, the problem is engagement, quality, and accountability, and we have solutions for every one of those. The path to equity is going to run through recovery. That is, if we're going to be able to bend the curve for morbidity and mortality, and to do that broadly, we have to think about people, place, and purpose. And finally, the problems are medical, uh, but the solutions are social. But technology here can have a really critical role in being able to get us to where we need to be. Still early days, and you'll hear great examples of what we're doing in this space, um, but it's still the first act of a five act play. Uh, lots of expectations, lots of hope, but as we've seen just on this conference, technology can also break down in ways that we often don't predict. Uh, that is the world that we live in right now. Don't give up hope because I think over the next three to five years, we're gonna be able to see this finally deliver for those who most need it. So I'll stop there. Sorry that we had to run through this very quickly. I'd love to have at least a couple of minutes for questions and I wanna uh, look forward to the panel as well where we'll be able to unpack much of what I've told you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Insel, for that wonderfully insightful um, keynote. And, you know, I uh, couldn't help just keep resonating that three P, three P's to recovery, to the pathway to recovery, that the, the people, the place, and the purpose, and how you outline loneliness, how you outline poverty and finding a mission as key elements to these. And then couldn't agree more with you how the problem definition can be written as a medical problem, but then really the solutions is, is really now is really about social justice. It's about uh, social, environmental, and political ways we need to approach these solutions. Thank you so much for that. So we have a few questions uh, that uh, we have coming in. Uh, so one of the questions is that to what extent are high costs and in insurance access to in-network providers an issue? to finding affordable mental health care? If I understood that, Pinar, the question is about access to, um, to providers. Yeah, it's, um, it's often assumed that that's the big, the big problem to solve is improving access. And it is a problem to solve, but it's not an access to providers only that's the problem. We have, there's this kind of idea that we don't have enough providers. Uh, in fact, there, according to SAMHSA, um, there's 600,000 people in the mental health workforce. Again, just by point of reference, there are about 200,000 dentists in America, 200,000 primary care docs. Um, it, there's an extraordinary number of people in this workforce. The problem isn't the numbers, it's uh, where they are distributed. So um, there are about five people, five psychiatrists per 100,000 in Idaho, about 28 per 100,000 in Massachusetts. The disparity geographically for psychologists is even greater. And the disparity for social workers is there as well. So it's if you need to go to brick and mortar, you're out of luck in many parts of the country, particularly in rural areas, but also in some some urban areas as well. That's a piece of it. Um, we've gotten over that with telehealth. So that has largely solved that part of the access problem or will solve it if we could get the licensing and credentialing out of the way. 
I think the biggest issue is not access, it's quality, that you can get access to a clinician, but the chance of that clinician having the training to deliver something that actually works for your specific problem is not great. And this is the piece that is uh, really exceptional in the mental health space. Of that 600,000 people in the workforce, there's just a handful who may have the training to give you the kind of therapy that works for obsessive compulsive disorder or for PTSD or for uh, symptoms of um, very uh, specific kinds of eating disorders. These are really critical issues that we have to begin to grapple with as we don't have a workforce that's trained up to have the quality um, to actually bend the curve. And that's egregious and that's fixable. And that's another place where technology can help. Um, another question is that you mentioned technology as a solution to mental illness, mental issues. Technology will also increase isolation and increase mental uh, illness. How should we handle technology as a double-edged sword? Yeah, it's totally, it's like every, every innovation, every technology, you know, it was the same way with the automobile in the beginning um, until we learned how to drive safely and we created the infrastructure we needed with better roads and better vehicles. And we're at that stage now. I mean, we've got, you know, huge issues around privacy, around predation, around um, surveillance and uh, consumerism, as it's called. We'll be able to fix those things. We have to fix those things in the same way we've done for other innovations. Um, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't give up on the idea that it's also a solution as well as a problem. Um, you know, if you think about Facebook as an example or Twitter, they may be the kind of early versions of things that just have to get much better. You could imagine that if you can create social media that is trusted and safe uh, and supportive, um, you can use the very same tools to do something of real value, something we're trying to do at Humanest. It's, it's not easy and it's difficult to compete in this environment, um, but I think it is both a problem and a solution. And now the challenge is to, um, to tilt the balance towards making these beneficial giving people more agency, uh, helping people to actually be empowered by these tools instead of um, defeated by them. Thank you. Another question uh, is asking about how do we address the privacy issues with technology? And then maybe, especially in the context of mental health, how do we do it in a non-invasive way um, to keep the engagement maximized? Yeah, it's, this is a tough one. And it's tough because we're still in the wild west of this field where um, it's often difficult to know if you engage with an app or a particular company that offers mental health care exactly what their privacy policies will be. You can ask and they should be posted and there are ways of testing that. But what happens when the company folds in six months? What happens to the data? Or what happens when they get bought out by another company that has different policies? So I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I think we're still struggling with trying to make sure we know how to preserve what's most important to people. What I find a little bit surprising is that the most um, active users of, uh, of these tools, particularly the online therapy tools, are either the very young or the very old. And those two groups seem to care much less about this issue um, than everybody in between. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Uh, it's probably a good thing for the companies. Not clear it's such a good thing for, for, for society. But um, that is an ongoing challenge that we've got to think through. Part of what we need to do now is in the same way that we developed kind of a regulatory standard for medications um, 103 years ago with the founding of the FDA. At that point, it was how do we distinguish medicine from snake oil? We're at that same point here, I think, in the development of digital therapeutics and digital tools for mental health, but we don't have the regulatory standards yet. We don't have the framework that says, this is helpful, this is snake oil, this is safe, this is not safe. 
and we've got to we've got to be able to work that out. We can't look to the FDA to do this. The FDA has never regulated therapy. They're not going to regulate digital therapy either. Uh, so we have to come up with a um, a place in a in a in a pool of people who will actually lay out those standards. There are some really important attempts to do that right now, and I don't think that's an unsolvable problem. It's just a developmental one. And I, again, as this field gets from act one to act two, we'll have a lot of that um, emerging. And, and I think that will help us to curb the Wild West mentality a little bit. Great. One other question, um, Dr. Insel, is uh, related to the idea that you know sometimes data analytics and technology can have built-in um, biases in them, uh, biases in data, biases in is an algorithms, biases and way technology interprets data. So this one question is um, asking um, and taking this community focus as well, how can we as community ensure that the technology that may be voice or type is defined and normalized across race and ethnic groups? Yeah, it's such an important question. You know, that's even true for the pulse oximeter I was reading last week. I mean, it's there's really um, some interesting issues about understanding the, um, the bias that's implicit in the tools. Um, you know, maybe I'm naive about this, uh, but having spent enough time at Google, um, I've begun to think that th there's a part of this that is actually fixable with the tools that we have now. Uh, so much of what comes out in the algorithms depends on what goes in on the data side. And so if we get better and better at being inclusive on the data collection, data acquisition, um, it's not the algorithms that are broken. It's really largely, it's the data that they're working on. Uh, and that's a fixable problem. So I think the key here is to ensure that um, the data are inclusive. And then the algorithms will do what they do, which is to uh, help us to find the patterns that matter uh, in, that are built in. I, I, actually, well, this is an issue. I think a bigger problem is the kind of uh, overfitting that is so much uh, endemic in this field right now. So that people are get, or think that they are finding really important relationships, some, sometimes that are biased, sometimes that are not. Uh, when the relationships aren't really going to be there through replication. So again, early days, we're learning a lot, important to call out questions like this and to figure out how to ensure that the, the tools that we're using are used for the broadest benefit. Thank you so much, Dr. Insal. I know there are a lot of other questions coming in from our audience. Uh, which unfortunately we uh, could not get um, a chance to answer all of these. Um, but I, we need to move forward with our uh, panel presentations. We thank you very, very much. And uh, please um, stay for our panel if you can as well. And so sorry for the technology problems again and again. It's, um, I'm glad we have different technologies where we can jump on and just move the dialogue. and. Uh, it's, um, thank you so much. Well, thank you. you, Pinar. Delighted to be part of this. And as I said at the beginning, I, actually, I think the kerfuffle with the technology was a very important lesson for uh, the topic of the day, which is what technology can do and what it can't. And I, I think after all, it, it's turned out pretty well. I look forward to the panel. So I'm going to drop off and I'll listen in. Uh, thanks to all the panelists for being here. I see a lot of uh, friends on the screen. Um, so have a great meeting. Take care.